during any retreat and pursuit, there is often plenty of fighting as the retreating force's rear guard fights to keep the enemy's pursuing guard off kilter, often with running skirmishing. And the British had some excellent light infantry troops for this. Everybody pictures the British as just standing in a line and shooting at one another. Uh, but light infantry tactics, the skirmishing, scouting, the British were actually very good at this as well, and they had assistance in this. you notice the green-coated troops that just entered the field right now. These are soldiers of the 2nd New York Militia. Now, the majority of militia did not receive uniforms. However, some of the more proficient units were issued with uniforms. Their unique uniform of green jackets with blue trousers actually came about due to a shortage of red material in the Canadas. So the uh, so Prevo, the lieutenant governor, he ordered a large amount of green cloth and blue cloth to equip the militia. By 1814, many of those militias would be re-equipped and would be almost indistinguishable from British redcoats out on the battlefield, not only in their looks, but also in their quality as they began to prove themselves out on the field. You'll notice as well a large number of civilians. With the American attack, a large number of people fled with the army. Uh, there was genuine fear that the enemy would burn, would pillage, and would take from anybody. And the American army did occupy a lot of civilian homesteads, oftentimes enforcing their will upon them. The people had little recourse. Uh, there's really only one big example of recourse, and that's the famous story of Laura Secord who due to her house being occupied, overheard American plans and was able to go and warn the British of the impending attack at Beaver Dams. Now something interesting about Laura Secord, everybody says she walked 32 kilometers and they're wrong. She walked 64 kilometers. People forget she had to go home afterwards because guess what happens if the Americans find out Laura is missing and their army just got ambushed. Her husband who's convalescing upstairs will be shot her children be thrown in the streets and her house will be burned down. Laura was attached to all three of those things. Now you see musicians out on the field. Fifes and drum corps were actually a key component of both the British and the American armies. Not only could they be useful for morale, playing music on the march, but they also were instrumental, pardon the pun, as communication across the field. When you hear the fife, it can be heard for miles, which is even better when they're in the camp with you. But the fife could also cut through the din of the battle. When you hear the muskets and the cannons going off, it's a dull, low thumps you're getting out of that. The high-pitched screech of the fife cuts through that noise, allowing it to be heard over the din. This means that if you need to send communications up and down the lines, the fife is able to carry far more than your voice can, drowned out by the sound of musketry. Now one of the things that assisted the British and Canadian retreat uh, immensely was American fears of our indigenous allies in this region. Uh, the Six Nations in particular in this region had proven themselves in early engagements such as Queenston Heights. And the Americans, many of them, had never encountered an indigenous individual before. They grew up with the stories. And there's woodcuts and newspaper articles that accurately describe what a Mohawk, uh, what a Mohawk man looks like. Seven feet tall, glowing red eyes, sharpened teeth, big long claws, and they are very partial to ripping your heart out of your chest before scalping you. We, of course, know that is completely false, but if that's what you've been raised on, the sound, because that's the thing, you don't see indigenous warriors a lot of times, the first thing. You hear them. You hear the war cries. You hear the shouts. And suddenly all those stories come back to you. It doesn't matter how brave you are, the boogeyman suddenly becomes real, and he's coming for you. That psychological effect is why we are standing in Canada today. There's barely a battle in the first half of the war that is not won either by the presence of Indigenous allies or the threat of the presence of Indigenous allies. Right, 
So now we see the Americans emerging out onto the battlefield. The American Army of 1812 uh, performed very poorly, but the Army of 1813 had begun to learn from their mistakes. They were beginning to weed out political officers. They were beginning to train better, equip better, and lead their men better out onto the battlefield. This was a shock for many of the British as they had kind of developed a rather uh, negative opinion of their brother Jonathan, as they called him. Now, a large portion of the American forces were made up of militia. Militia in this time period is basically if you're an adult male in the United States of Canada, welcome into the militia. During peacetime, training for the militia often consisted of showing up to a fort maybe once, twice a year, usually on a holiday, and proving you could operate a firearm. If you could load and fire your musket three times, you would be rewarded with free beer for the rest of the day. I'm sure some of the reservists that were out here earlier would really like that payment plan to come back. Now, it wasn't just a beer fest. Uh, like I said, it was usually on a holiday, so they would usually have fireworks at night, there'd be bands playing, and it was more of a, kind of like a county festival sort of thing, more of a party. But when the war breaks out, militia are deadly serious. These men would be called up for anywhere from as little as 30 days to as long as 18 months service, in which they would be trained and equipped as best they could. The difficulty being, is that the militia did not always get uniforms. I mentioned the Second Yorks. They were lucky they got those yeah, uniforms. Yeah. But if you look on the American side, you'll see men in blue frocks with red fringe and some of them in a mishmash. Militia kind of sometimes had to wear whatever was on top of their dresser, which is fine until the other side shows up in mili with militia wearing pretty much the same thing. How do you tell who's who? For example, I am dressed as militia officer. Which side? It's a trick question. I dress like this so that if the British are doing something screwy, I can say, oh, I'm an American right now. And if the Americans are doing something screwy, I go, oh, I'm a Brit right now. It's a really good look. I advise it for anybody. But for militiamen out on the field, they don't have that luxury. They need to quickly identify themselves so that they do not get harmed by their own side. So from battle to battle, they try to find ways to identify themselves. For example, at Chippewa, the US militia just didn't wear hats. It could be as simple as that. sides are firing in volleys, tightly packed groups of men firing simultaneously. It's often uh, kind of a joke amongst people, the joke around, you know, they just stood there and took turns shooting at one another, but the reason they did this was actually quite practical. It is because of the firearms. The flintlock musket that many of these men are carrying, flintlocks, they're great guns for the time, but they have their problems. The flintlock is exposed to the elements, which means a gust of wind, not sharp enough. Anything can cause it to misfire. They need to have a 20% misfire rate in good conditions. So you got 20% misfire rate, and then on top of that, there's smoothbore. Which means unlike rifles, which give a spin, so the ball goes straight into the target, these, at 100 yards, large bear is 9 feet in any direction. So how do you hit something, and how do you get enough of them to work? Mass fire power. Muskets firing away, 80 of them should go off, and 80 musket balls, even at two, 300 yards, you're going to hit something. But this mass firepower led to what is probably the most common thing about this era that people notice, and that is bright, elaborate uniforms. Because as you notice when they fire, you can see how much smoke is created. You can imagine a battlefield such as Stony Creek, where there are close to 2,000 men. 
They are firing muskets. They are firing cannons that are firing pounds of gunpowder. It did not take long for the field to become absolutely cloaked in smoke. Their account stained the first time you could see your enemy was often 20 paces away. So camouflage was a great idea today, but 200 years ago you wanted something that at 20 paces would scream out to your side, do not shoot me, I'm on your side. So the British, bright red. And the reason they picked red, the same reason why the Americans also like the gray, it's cheap. The same reason why uh, barns are painted red. It was the cheapest dye available when they were uniforming themselves back in the 1600s. So bright red for the British, bright blue for the Americans. Those green-coated troops, or the Americans in gray, they're at risk of being shot at by both sides. At Lundy's Lane, there was a green-coated Canadian regiment, the Glengarry Light Infantry. They suffered more casualties from the British line than from the Americans, simply because they were not identified. And there was a great American brigade that for 20 minutes was getting shot at by both sides. You shoot first, you ask questions later. At least that way you're hopefully going to survive. mentioning about the reliability of the muskets, there are ways to fix the problems that can come with the musket. You may have to change for a new flint, you may have to clean it out, you may have to do something called pricking the vent. There's a tiny hole at the base of the barrel, you gotta clean that out. You may have heard the term flash in the pan, that comes from these muskets. It's where the pan ignites but not the charge in the barrel. This is particularly dangerous because a poorly trained soldier might reload. Now he has two rounds down the barrel. Flash, reloads. Now he's got three. Flash, loads four. Now he has a bomb. And there are muskets that were found uh, with multiple rounds in them, including an American one found in the Shadowgate River, uh, which I believe had seven rounds down the barrel. That American is very lucky to have dropped it in the river. Now with the flint, you can actually give it a new sharp edge. It's called napping. Tap at it at the end with a tool, gives you a new sharpened edge. Uh, if you've heard the term, don't get caught napping, that is where that comes from. It has nothing to do with sleeping. If you're napping your flint, you can't shoot back. Don't get caught napping. American lines, you notice they have some of the artillery up on the end there. Field guns like these were extremely popular at the time period because they could wreak terrible damage on these tightly packed formations. Those guns are light field pieces, firing a solid iron cannonball. Uh, the British actually did testing and found that at 500 yards, those could cleave through up to 17 human beings. also use something called canister shot. Imagine, if you will, a tin can or a bag that's filled with musket balls that when you fire the gun, you have turned it into a giant shotgun. A man who is unfortunately at the receiving end of it survived and recorded that it sounded like locusts descending upon the pharaohs of old, and when it struck men, it sounded like fabric being torn apart.
They would be trained not only in the handling of a musket, but also in the handling of an axe, a spade, a pickaxe. They would be able to tear down defenses, rebuild defenses, and basically smash their way whenever they had to. The apron was to protect the uniform, not only from their work, but also from blood, because one of their additional duties out on the battlefield had to do with insurance claims. Officers had to purchase everything, including their horses. If you wanted to get your money back for your horse that had been killed, you had to prove it had been killed. So that means somebody has to go and collect the hooves. That was the pioneer's job.